Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, and welcome to the Crazy Hat Chemist. So here we go with a continuation of covalent bonding worksheet number one. This is going to be part two of this video. So uh, make sure that you first watch part one. So uh, just a very, very brief recap, because I had gone over this in detail for the part one of this video series. And uh, that is the following. Make sure that you watch my entire playlist on covalent bonding in um, honors chemistry. Um, and specifically, the Crazy Hat Chemist, Honors Chemistry 6, that's the Unit 6, the Covalent Bonding Collection, Bonding 28 Molecular Geometry. That covers this um, slide right here that you see before you, okay? Another one that is really important to watch is this one right here, and that would be the following. The Crazy Hat Chemist, Honors Chemistry 6, same unit, of course, the Covalent Bonding collection bonding 11 lewis dot structure rules and so these are the rules for lewis dot structures make sure that you follow these i will be following these throughout this video as i did in video number uh, one part one and of course then at the bottom here um resonant structures geometric isomeric structures that's important as well Peeling this away, I will also assume that you have um, a firm understanding of the number of valence electrons based on group numbers and where the periods are. So the valence electrons are these vertical columns, uh, group one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and eight, excluding helium. Okay, and then the periods are the red numbers on the left-hand side of the periodic table. That's period one, period two, period three, four, five, six, and seven. And the most electronegative element there is on the periodic table is fluorine. And then um, the elements uh, decrease in their electronegativity as you get farther from fluorine. So that is francium would be the least electronegative. And the noble gases really have very, very low electronegativity values, even though they are not, um, even though they're relatively close to fluorine, they still have very low electronegativity values. Another thing that I didn't mention in part number one, and that is the following, you will very rarely find any of the halogens in the center, even if they're farther away from fluorine than maybe another element or chance. So for example, you will find certainly a carbon in the middle, but not an iodine. All right. So hopefully that gives you a real quick recap of everything. And uh, what we did last time is we started this uh, worksheet and we completed the following sets. Um, we first get the valence electrons and then the, we total up those valence electrons working pairs. And then we follow our Lewis dot structure rules and we get the Lewis dot structure. We get the geometric name, uh, the Vesper shape, and then we get the hybridization, bond angle, polarity, and uh, resonance or isomeric structures. And I believe we ended right here. Okay. And so let's see if we can continue on with this little journey that we started. And uh, let's see, here we go. This is where we ended. We talked about the resonance structures for carbonate ion, and I drew out all three of those resonance structures. And so hopefully you're going to be happy with that. All right. So let's continue on with our next one. That's BECL2. All right, so uh, part number two, let's begin, BECL2. All right, fantastic. So here we go, uh, based on the group numbers on the periodic table, beryllium uh, has two valence electrons. There's one of those, chlorine is seven and two. That is a total number of 16 electrons. And then we're going to divide this by two such that we get pairs. And so that would be eight pairs. And then the least electronegative element goes in the middle, but never hydrogen. That is the uh, element that is furthest away from fluorine, fluorine being the most electronegative. 
then we have BE, and then we have the two CLs, and then a CL here and a CL here. And then we're going to place these eight pairs of electrons. The first thing that we're going to do is put bonding pairs of electrons between the central element and the outside element. That is like such central element, outside element. That's like such. That's one, two pairs of the eight pair. I have six pair yet remaining. The next rule is place lone pairs of electrons around the outside elements. And that would be three total pairs, four, five, six, seven, and eight. And now I have, um, now what we're gonna do is like what we did before, if you recall, uh, what I did is we are going to circle each element and then ask, do we have an octet? Yes, most certainly we have an octet. Do we have an octet? Yes, most certainly we have an octet. That is two, four, six, eight, two, four, six, eight. And then I'm going to circle that bolt, beryllium in the middle. Do we have an octet? No, we do not, okay. So there are certain elements that follow the octet rule and other elements that um, don't follow the octet rule. And it just so happens that beryllium and boron, so boron and beryllium are, um, are two elements that can be and are many times frequently electron deficient. So that means that this is okay. Furthermore, um, Chlorine is a halogen and sharing is not caring for halogens. That means this halogen will not remove these pair of electrons and form a double bond right here. And the reason is because halogens, chlorine is one of them, fluorine, chlorine, bromine, and iodine are the halogens, okay? Halogens are very electronegative and they do not, because they're electronegative, they do not like to share electrons. So they're greedy. Um, so if you are sharing, then you're willing to give up some electrons and the halogens are most certainly not. So you will not find double bonded halogens under uh, the vast majority of circumstances. I won't say always, but it's almost always. So do not double bond a halogen. That's a bad thing. So I'm gonna erase all these pencil marks and leave what remains that is correct. And this is the correct Lewis dot structure for uh, beryllium dichloride here, okay? And then from this, we're going to get our X geometry, and that's A, X. So A is the central beryllium, and the X1, X2, that's A, X2, that's linear. And the hybridization is S, P, hybridize, S, P, hybridize. Since this is linear, that has a bond angle of 180 degrees. And because the chlorines are the same, um, that means that this is non-polar. And there is no resonance, no isomeric structures uh, of any kind on this. And so let me show you the model for this. This is a linear type structure. And so this is what this will look like. So the beryllium is, uh, let me put this down here so you can see the Lewis dot structure and the model. So the beryllium is this central atom here. And these gray things are the bonding pairs of electrons. This is not showing the non-bonding pairs of electrons, so that's okay. And then the uh, green, um, uh, green elements here are the chlorines. So this is most certainly linear because the green things are symmetrical. That is the same. That means that this is going to be um, non-polar. Okay, fantastic. That's looking good. Let's move on to our next one here. That will be, so let's pull that model aside and then we'll slide this on up and then we're going to be doing this next one. Did you know that today's video is brought to you by none other than the crazy hat chemist? So please watch my videos on YouTube. I like how I throw that in there every now and then, you know, I mean, we got to have a sponsor and, uh, uh, certainly, I can be my own sponsor, I think. I don't know. What do you think? <laughs> I'll just give it a try saying that I'm my own sponsor. Anyways, let's move on to this next one here. So pay particular attention to this next one. It's a complicated problem. And um, so we're going to get moving on to this one. Here we go. So uh, carbon has four valence electrons and there are two of them. Hydrogen has one valence electron, there's two. And fluorine has seven valence electrons, there's two of them. So that's a total of 24 electrons. And as always, we're going to divide it by two and that will give me 12 pairs. 
right? Okay, fantastic. So what we're gonna do is I'm going to place another sheet of paper right on top of this one, because it's going to be very important. This one's going to be a rather complex set of structures here, okay? And uh, so let me show you what this looks like. So there are two carbons, two hydrogens, and two fluorines. So I'm gonna draw something right here, and then you're gonna find out that this is not possible, and I'm gonna scratch this out, this won't work, and then I'm gonna pull out another piece of paper to show you what is actually the correct set. So um, the least electronegative goes in the middle, that's furthest from fluorines and never hydrogen. So it can't be the hydrogen, and it's furthest from fluorine, so therefore it cannot be the fluorine. Then this carbon, um, will be in the center. And outside of that would be um, a hydrogen. And one of the things that I tell my students is that we're going to place these atoms around like uh, the face of a clock. So I start off with the three o'clock, then the six o'clock position, then the nine o'clock position, and then the high noon position. And then you're going to find out that you have one more carbon left over, so you can place it anywhere you want to. And then we have bonding pairs of electrons from the central element to the outside elements. That's one, two, three, four, and five bonding pairs of electrons. And then you're going to ask yourself, uh-oh, we just violated a rule. Okay, and this is a very, very critical rule. So I'm going to um, pull out my periodic table and show you what this rule is. That rule is the following. There are four elements. That's carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, and fluorine. These four elements right here in period two must obey the octet rule. That means that they have to have eight electrons. They cannot have less. They cannot have more. And what just happened, whoops, sorry about that. What just happened is we violated the octet rule with this carbon. You should see that carbon has two, four, six, eight, ten. And this is a violation of the octet rule. So this does not work. It will never work. So what's going to have to happen is the following. So keep in mind what we have. I'm going to pull another sheet of paper here because we're going to need more space. I'm going to slide this up. So we're working just with this C2H2F2. So what we're going to do is we're going to start branching the carbon. Okay, and so uh, this is an inorganic chemistry class that we're talking about here at this moment in time. But if you were to continue on with your chemistry journey of educational chemistry journey, and I hope that you do, the next class after a full year course of inorganic chemistry would be organic chemistry. And I highly recommend that you do that. You'll have a much better understanding of chemistry in general. Inorganic and organic chemistry, completely two different birds. So here we go. Um, let's continue on with this. So we're going to have a carbon and then we're going to start branching off. So we're going to have another carbon. So we're effectively going to have two central elements here. And then what we're going to do is we're going to place the hydrogens around one of the carbons and then the fluorines around the other carbon. Okay. All right. And here we go. And we're going to flip this up here so you can see the number. I have 12 pairs of electrons that we're doing here. So 12 pairs. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, and then the next set. So what I've done is bonding pairs of electrons between the central and the outside elements, lone pairs as what is appropriate. I cannot do lone pairs on the hydrogens. My next rule is to put a lone pair on the central element. Now I'm doing this in pencil because I'm going to have to erase this. Okay. You should see that this hydrogen has a duet. This hydrogen has a duet and that is correct. This fluorine has an octet, and that is correct. This fluorine has an octet, and that is correct. This carbon on the right-hand side has an octet. And then this carbon on the left-hand side does not have an octet. So I have my 12 pairs. I've used my 12 pairs. I cannot use more. I cannot use less. So what I'm going to have to do is take this pair of electrons and bring it into this here and make myself a double bond. And I'm going to draw that right here, just like that. Then what I'm going to do is I'm going to erase all this pencil mark stuff so that you can fully appreciate and see what is actually happening here. Just a moment. Okay, so let's uh, erase all of this here like this. 
and then you're going to see what ultimately comes about. Okay. All right. All right. So now you should see that uh, the right hand carbon, excuse me, the right hand hydrogen has a duet. The right the uh, lower right-hand hydrogen has a duet. This left-hand fluorine has a octet, an octet. And you should see that carbon, and I'll just call this carbon one and carbon two, for simplicity's sake here, an organic chemistry uh, thing that you'll come across in organic chemistry. So this carbon one has two, four, six, eight. This carbon two has two, four, six, eight. So they both have an octet, which is eight, All right? Fantastic. So now um, what we're going to do is we're going to be able to answer all the questions just based on this Lewis dot structure. So I'm going to slide this down and then um, we are going to answer our questions regarding this. So what goes in this next one here is the shape. And so the shape can be oriented here based on any one of these two carbons. So I have carbon one or carbon two and the shape happens to be the same. In fact, in at every carbon center, there is a shape. And you'll find this out as uh, these atoms and molecules start getting more complex and start branching off. So we'll take a look at carbon one and figure out what its shape is. It's um, X, so excuse me, A for that carbon, X1, X2, X3. So it's AX3. And then we'll take a look at carbon two, and that is an A, X1, X2, X3. So it's AX3 no matter what. So we're really lucky that give, this gives the same shape for both carbon one and carbon two, which is trigonal planar. And this is SP1, P2 hybridized or SP1, P2 hybridized. So S. P2 hybridized. If it is sp2 hybridized and it's trigonal planar, that has bond angles 120. Okay. And then um, now we have another issue with regards to polarity. Um, and then the next question is our next column. Does it have res resonance or geometric isomers? So it has no resonance. Even though it has a double bond, this double bond cannot be moved in an alternate location. You cannot double bond the halogen of the fluorines. You certainly cannot double bond those hydrogens. No way, no how. But this does have what's called geometric isomers. Okay, so this has what's called geometric isomers. So in order to write the geometric isomers, what we're going to do is we're going to rewrite these carbons here. And we're going to place one carbon here, one carbon here, just like what we did before. And we're going to have this same structure or a similar structure as to what we had before. Okay, and I'm going to give you an example here and, and then we'll come back to this. So hold on just a moment. All right, magically, uh, what happened here is Mr. Potato Head just popped into the equation, if you will, so to speak. So um, a little bit of advertisement here, not for Mr. Potato Head, but for things that you can do with Mr. Potato Head. So this is going to be important for our geometric isomers. So don't worry, folks, I am not going completely crazy, even though I am the crazy hat chemist, I am not going completely crazy. So here we go. Mr. Potato Head. I'm assuming that you're maybe somewhat familiar, familiar with Mr. Potato Head. If you're not, then you should become familiar with Mr. Potato Head. Here he is. And one of the neat things about Mr. Potato Head is that what you can do as a child is you're like, oh my gosh, Mr. Potato Head, there he is. So I'm going to take off his arm on the right-hand side and I'm gonna take off his ear and I'm going to place his arm up here where the ear used to be and place the ear over there. Oh my gosh, there's Mr. Potato Head. Now Mr. Potato Head is looking kind of strange. And I, you know what I could do is I could place, take off this ear on the left-hand side, this hand arm on the left-hand side. It's a brand new Mr. Potato Head. So bear with me here and exchange those as well. Rather strange Mr. Potato Head, but you know, that's why his mustache is maybe off to the side. Okay, and oh, wait, wait, you could do more. You could actually take off this ear, take off this arm. Hold on, let's see if we can do it. There we go. And uh, exchange those two things together. And you have most certainly a, well, very unusual Mr. Potato Head. And 
Yes, I would slide his mustache all the way over and Google his eyes there just a little bit. So I hope what you see what I've done is I have kept the same um, number of elements, um, but what I have done is change their location. This is an example of geometric isomerism. So here we go. Let's see how this um, holds out in our um, an example that we have here. All right, so we're gonna throw Mr. Potato Head off to the side. Well, gently place him um, because otherwise my wife will be very unhappy. And so what we're gonna do is zoom in on this like what we were before and here we go. So bearing in mind, keeping in mind what we just did with Mr. Potato Head, what we're going to do, we're gonna do the same thing with the hydrogens and the fluorines. So we're gonna keep this double bonded carbon there. We're gonna keep these basic setup right here of the carbons. And now what we're going to do is we're going to rearrange the hydrogens and the fluorines and move them in different locations. So what we're going to do is we're going to keep this fluorine up here like it was before, but we're going to exchange this fluorine and this hydrogen so that the two fluorines are on the top and now the hydrogens are on the bottom. The fluorines need to have an octet, so let's keep them having an octet like what they did before. Okay, and then you should see that this structure right here is an alternate structure. It still has carbon one, it still has carbon two. All the things that applied before still apply now, and that is the following. The shape of it is AX3, that is A for the central carbon, X1, X2, X3. Central carbon A, X1, X2, X3, and that's trigonal planar for both carbon one and carbon two. It is also still sp2 hybridized, that's sp1, p2, or sp1, p2, just like this one over here was, and sp2 hybridized trigonal planar at this central carbon, and at this central carbon, carbon one and carbon two, it's a 120 degree bond angle. But yet, wait, for the same price, for the same price, folks, that's right. If you order now, you can see that you can get one more geometric isomer. So let's see if we can draw that third and last geometric isomer. And you see that I'm drawing the same basic pattern that I did before. I'm gonna have a carbon one, carbon two. And what we're going to do is exchange the fluorines and the hydrogen such that they are alternate to each other. So we'll put a hydrogen here, a hydrogen here, and a fluorine here, a fluorine here. The fluorines need to have three sets of lone pairs of electrons, just like in all of the Lewis dot structures. And now we have our last structure. All right. So a few things that we need to know about these. These are geometric isomers. Okay, and then um, another thing that we need to know about these is the following. They all have a same trigonal planar structure at carbons one, two, and three, okay? Um, this structure, there's naming for this, and I won't get into the organic chemistry naming today, but in the future, you certainly will. But this one here, since the fluorines are on the same side, this is a cis kind of structure. Cis means same side. Okay, that is the fluorines are on one side, the hydrogens are on one side. You can also look at this structure as the fluorines are one side and the hydrogens on the other side. This is also a cis structure as well. Whereas this one is like transcontinental railroad. So the transcontinental railroad goes across. And so you should see that the fluorines are now across. They are not on the same side. So this is a trans like structure because it's transcontinental railroad, okay? In terms of polarity, polarity needs to be asymmetric and polar. So if I were to draw um, bond polarity, so these are bond polarities, bond polarity, the fluorine is more electronegative than the carbon, fluorine is more electronegative than the carbon, carbon is more electronegative than hydrogen, carbon is more electronegative than hydrogen. I can draw one arrow to sum up all three of these. It's kind of like if I sum up these vectors, if you get into that math. So this will be like this. And if I can draw this arrow, this is a, a molecular dipole. So a molecular dipole. 
and di means two. That means it has two poles. There's a positive end and a negative end. Okay, so this is the positive end of the pole. This is the negative end of the pole. There's more electrons over here. Okay, and that means that this is polar. This is a polar molecule. Okay, this one right over here, um, bond dipoles are as follows, just like before, the fluorine is more electronegative than the carbon, and the carbons are more electronegative than the hydrogen. You can draw a molecular dipole. Here is a molecular dipole. If you can draw a molecular dipole, then that molecule is polar. So this one is polar, and um, this one is polar. Both cis structures are polar. Now we're going to draw our bond dipoles here. Bond dipole. Notice that these bond dipoles are kind of like a pulling in opposite directions. So we're like kind of pulling them in opposite directions. And then these bond dipoles are pushing in the same direction, but the same amount. So the bond dipoles here with the fluorines and the bond dipoles here with the hydrogens cancel each other out. So this is non-polar. Okay. All right. Fantastic. This is looking really good. Now what I need to do is show you the models that each one of these represents. So this first one right over here, this one right here, take that into consideration. The fluorines are on one side and the hydrogens are on the other. That is represented by this model right here. This next one here, the fluorines are on the top and that is represented by, well, I'm going to have to zoom on out here so that you can get all of these on here. That is represented by this one where the fluorines are on the top. And then the trans, these are the two cis-like structures. And you can see this, it's the cis and the cis. You can see the double bond here between the two carbons here that inhibits rotation, even though there's rotation around the single bond, okay? Um, and then the trans-like structure, the trans-like structure is right here like this, okay? All right, so we have the two cis structures. We have the one single trans structure structure. The two cis structures are polar. That means there's a sidedness and there's the dipole of the molecule, the dipole of the molecule, and there is no molecular dipole on the trans structure. That's why it's nonpolar. Okay. Um, just something so that you are aware of. Uh, another structure is not this one. This is just the same structure if you rotate it as well as this is the same structure. That is not a different structure that you can draw, and this is not a different structure. So there's only three I geometric isomers here for this, okay? All right, so I'm hoping that, that that was a very complicated problem, and this is one of the very important problems that you should all be aware of that you should be able to do, because um, this most certainly will be on the test. It's always on the test. <laughs> Anyways, um, Hopefully you got that. Now what we're going to do is move on to the next problem. It's not nearly as complicated as this one, so that's good. So let's uh, pull these models off to the side. Let's uh, pull this piece of paper over. We'll come on back over here, and we'll finish up this one. Zoom in, and here we go. All right, so let's see what we can do with this next one right here, and that is uh, the Cl2 and an S. So... The number of valence electrons in a chlorine are seven, and there's two of them. Number of valence electrons in the sulfur, six. There's one of those. That's a total of 20. And there are, we're going to always divide by two, so we're going to get 10 pairs. All right. The least electronegative element goes in the middle, but never hydrogen. And it is the furthest away from the fluorine that goes in the middle, and that would most certainly be the sulfur. And then I'm going to place the chlorines around that in the three o'clock and the six o'clock position. Okay. And then I'm going to have a single bond between the central and the outside, central and outside, single bond. Then I'm going to put lone pairs of electrons on the outside elements. One, two, three. And that's an octet on that chlorine. One, two, three. And that's an octet on that chlorine. The next rule is to place lone pairs on the central element, and that will go on the sulfur. And then this is what I imagine in my mind's eye, and hopefully you um, can see this. I'm going to draw this in pencil and then erase it. Okay, this has an octet for that chlorine. This chlorine here has an octet. This sulfur here has an octet. 
So the octet rule has been validated. So I'm going to erase that just so that you are uh, aware of that. All right. Then what we're going to do is we're going to get the structure. The structure is A is going to represent this. The sulfur is represented by an A. And the chlorines are represented by Xs. There's two chlorines. And then these lone pairs right here. So these lone pairs, there's one lone pair and another lone pair. Those are E's. Okay, so hopefully you see that, that, that the E's are most certainly different than the X's. Okay, all right. So what does that correspond to? That is bent. Um, another name for this is angular. So it's either bent or angular. You don't have to write both of those. And then the hybridization of this is S, P1, P2, P3. This is S, P3 hybridized. And since it is a X2, E2, and SP3 hybridized, um, some textbooks will say that this is less than 109.5 degrees, um, but some of them will also say that this is 105, since it has two bonding and two lone pairs. Anything that is bent or angular is polar. And there are no resonance structures and no geometric isomers on this structure here. All right, and then let me show you the model for this one. That is going to be a bent flex structure, and it is always polar, and here is the model for that right here. Oh, wait, let me see if you can see that. Here we go. So the red is representing the sulfur in this particular case. I know that yellow is typically most of the time the sulfur, but this um, red is typically representing oxygen. But in this case, it will be the same shape. The gray structures are the bonding pairs of electrons, and the white ones here in this particular case are representing the chlorines, and these tans are representing the lone pairs. You can see that this is most certainly an asymmetric structure. That is, this side is different than this side. There is a molecular dipole that is uh, uh, going light just like this. So this is a molecular dipole. It's jamming right through here, and yeah, goes in that direction. Fantastic. All right, so let's get moving on to the next problem here. And let's pull in that sheet of paper. Here we go. And excellent, not quite. Yep, there we go. Awesome. All right, so our next structure here is I31 minus. So seven valence electrons, there are three of them. And then this um, charge here, since it is a negative charge and we're adding up electrons and electrons are negative, that means that we are going to add one more for that. So that's going to be 22 of total electrons. I'm going to divide this by two and I'm going to get 11 pairs. Okay, so 11 pairs of electrons is what I have here. So the least electronegative goes in the middle, but never hydrogen. That's my rule. But just so happens that I just have three iodines. So I don't really have a choice here. So I'm going to have to place an iodine right in the middle there. And then I'm going to place the other iodines surrounding that um, just like such. And then, so my rules are to place bonding pairs of electrons between the central and the outside element, central and the outside element, bonding pairs between the central and the outside element. My next rule is to place lone pairs of electrons on the outside elements. So that would be... Um, one, two, three, four, five, and six. So thus far, I have drawn one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, eight. So I have a three more pair yet remaining. Those three pairs are going to go dump them on the central element. And then we are going to have this structure here. And you should see that these are lone pairs on the central element right here that I'm drawing there in the red. You don't have to draw the little red circles. I'm just trying to highlight that those are lone pairs on the central element that you see. Okay. And one other thing that we must include here, since this has a charged species, we must include the brackets on this and that charge in the upper right-hand corner, just like as it was right there in the upper right-hand corner. Okay. All right, um, in terms of the axe-like structure, this is A for this central iodine, um, X for this iodine, and X for that iodine, that's two. And then E 
um, for the central lone pairs that are on the central atom. So one, two, three, so that is three. And that corresponds to a shape that is linear. This is the second linear that we have, okay? Um, and I'm gonna show you both of those um, linear-like structures here in just a moment. Um, and But we are going to continue with the hybridization. The hybridization is sp1, p2, p3d. So it's sp3d hybridized. And um, if it's linear and it's sp3d hybridized, then it has bond angles of 180. Okay. And this structure, because it is symmetrical, is nonpolar. And then let me show you this uh, model for this. So this uh, purple here in the center is representing that central iodine and these um, greens are representing the um, iodines on the outside. And then these tan structures are representing the three sets of lone pairs on the central element. And you should see that this is a trigonal bipyramidal structure in its electron domains, but it is a linear structure. And that is most certainly different than this linear structure here that we had earlier. And um, yeah, it is different, but it's similar, right? Because they're both linear. They have the same bond angle, but their hybridization is most certainly different, okay? With this linear structure, you can see that since the iodines are the same, that means that this is nonpolar, All right? Fantastic. That one's looking like a fantastic one. We got that one nailed. Now we're going to move on to the next one. That is XEI4. Let's move this on up here. XeI4. All right, so xenon, that's a noble gas, so it has eight valence electrons. There's one of those. Iodine, that's seven, and there are four of those. So we're going to add these all up. That's 36, and then we, of course, always divide by two because 36 is too big for me to count up, and so that's going to be 18 pairs. So now I got 18 pairs. So the central element is the least electronegative, but never, um, but never hydrogen. And so um, the least electronegative will not be a halogen. So therefore the uh, xenon is going to go in the middle there like that. Then we're gonna have the iodine surrounding that like the, th like the faces of a clock, three o'clock, three o'clock, six o'clock, six o'clock, nine o'clock, nine o'clock, and high noon at the OK Corral. And there we go, high noon. Now we're gonna place um, the electron pairs as is appropriate of our 18 following our Lewis dot structure rules. That is a bonding pair of electrons between the central element and the outside elements. And there we got that one. Then we're gonna place lone pairs on the outside element. So this is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, and 16. So I have two more pair. The next rule is to place them on the on the central atom as lone pairs. And there we go with that. All right. We're going to draw this axe structure. The A is that central xenon. That's A. And then how many elements are physically attached to that? One, two, three, four. That's X, four. And then are there any lone pairs on the central element? Yes, there are. Those are E's. How many E's? That's one and two. That's two. Okay. And this corresponds to square planar. And square planar um, uh, has bond angles of 90 degrees. And square planar, it has a hybridization of S, P1, P2, P3. D1, D2. So that's SP3, D2. It's an octahedral arrangement of electron domains. Okay. So octahedral, uh, octahedral arrangement of electron domains, but the shape itself is square planar. And let me show you that. This is the square planar structure here. So you should see that the green things are the iodines, and those are all within the same plane. And you should see that that's a square. And the tan things are representing the lone pairs of electrons and they must be opposite each other. They cannot be adjacent because lone pairs acquire or are necessitate the most amount of space. That's why they are opposite and that's why you can't have them right adjacent to each other. That's impossible uh, geometrically. 
And so you should see since the um, iodines are all the same on the outside, uh, the green things are the same on the outside, that means that this is a structure that is similar and nonpolar. So nonpolar. All right, fantastic. You realize that this uh, video is brought to you by and promoted by and sponsored by the Crazy Hat Chemist. That's right, folks. I am the Crazy Hat Chemist, and I am sponsoring this video. All right, if there was such a thing. All right, so let's move on to the next one here, and let's see what we can hammer out with this one. Carbon has four valence electrons. There's one of those. Uh, hydrogen has one valence electron. There's two of those. Oxygen has six valence electrons. There's one of those. That's a 12 total electrons. I'm going to divide that by two. That will give me six pairs. The central element is the least electronegative, but never hydrogen. So therefore, it is carbon. Okay, And then the outside elements are going to be the oxygen and two hydrogens. And I already know this basic structure here, but I'm going to have the oxygen, a hydrogen, and a hydrogen, just like such. Then I'm going to place six pairs of electrons. The first rule is bonding pairs of electrons between the central and outside, central and outside, central and outside, and then lone pairs of electrons on the outside elements. And that would be, so one, two, three, four, five, and six. And then what we're going to do is hydrogen follows the duet rule. Hydrogen follows the duet rule. Oxygen follows the octet rule. Carbon follows the duet rule excuse me, carbon follows the octet rule, but yet it doesn't have an octet. So that's a problem. So therefore, sharing is caring. I'm going to take this pair of electrons. I'm going to share it and bring it in here and have myself a double bond here like this, just like that. And then I'm going to erase all my pencil marks so that you see what is actually remaining on this. Okay, that looks fantastic. I like how that looks. Um, yes. Beautiful thing, beautiful thing. Um, all right, so we've got this central carbon and uh, hydrogens attached to it, and then we have this oxygen right here, like uh, that. We have this oxygen that has eight, two, four, six, eight. We have this carbon that has two, four, six, eight. That's an octet for both the oxygen and carbon, and a duet for this hydrogen and a duet for this hydrogen here. The central element is carbon, and that is an A. I have three elements attached to it. Those are X's, and there's three of those, so that's three. And I do not have any lone pairs on the central atom. I do have them all over here, so that does not include lone pairs. So AX3 is corresponding to trigonal or trigonal, 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 whatever you want to call it. It doesn't matter. Um, planar. And the hybridization of this is SP1P2. SP2, and that is bond angles of 120. And um, we're going to show you the Lewis stru structure of that and the molecular model of that. And so this does not show the lone pairs on the oxygens, but here is the carbon, here are the two hydrogens, and here is the oxygen. You should see that that's a double bond right there. And this is most certainly asymmetric. It has a molecular dipole that would be running right through there like that. So that is asymmetric and therefore this is polar. Okay, fantastic. Nailed that one down. Hopefully that works out well for you. Okay, let's do the next one here. All right, so we're gonna pull this model off to the side and we're gonna do this one. Um, and I have labeled this as a chlorine and a fluorine, just so that you understand that it's not a carbon, an iodine and a fluorine. No, it's a chlorine and a fluorine. This also has a charge that's a plus one charge here. So what we're gonna do is this chlorine has seven valence electrons. There's one of those. This fluorine has seven valence electrons. There's four of those. And then this plus is we're going to minus one from this whole entire setup here. So that will leave us with 34 electrons, right? Um, seven times five, that's 35, minus one, that's 34, and then we always divide by two. So now I'm gonna have 17 pairs, okay? So 17 pairs, looking fantastic right there, just like that, 17 pairs. 
right? And let's see, the least electronegative goes in the middle, but never hydrogen. So I have a choice of either the chlorine or the fluorine, and the um, fluorine is the most electronegative, most certainly. So that chlorine is going to go right in the middle. And then I'm going to have the fluorines surrounding that. There's one, uh, two, three, and four fluorines, just like that. All right, fantastic. All right, now what we're going to do is we're going to place the uh, bonding pairs of electrons between the central and the outside, central and outside, central and outside, central and outside, then lone pairs on the outside elements. I've used up one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen. 16, 16, and I have one more pair yet remaining, but yet all the fluorines have an octet, so I cannot place any more on the fluorines. And then my last pair is going to go on that central chlorine for my 17th pair. Additionally, I'm going to have brackets around this because it has a charge, and that charge is a 1 plus. I'm going to have that in the upper right-hand corner like this. So there is my Lewis dot structure. This corresponds to an X of A, that's the central chlorine, X, those are the four fluorines, and then a single E, that's this E on the central um, chlorine there like that. This corresponds to a physical shape of diphenoidal. Diphenoidal or seesaw. It's an or statement. And it doesn't matter which you, one you write on there. It's either diphenoidal or seesaw. It uh, just, it doesn't matter, whichever one. So that's pretty cool. All right, now we're going to do the hybridization of this. This is S, P1, P2, P3, D. So it's S, P3, D hybridized. Okay, and if it is diphenoidal, then it has bond angles that there are two bond angles for trigonal bipyramidal geometries. This is a trigonal bipyramidal structure. Okay, and typically those bond angles are 120 and 90, but because of that lone pair, these bond angles will be decreased, and that is going to be less than 120 and less than 90. If it is diphenoidal, it is always going to be polar. Um, because it is asymmetric. And let me show you this diphenoidal structure. Here is the diphenoidal structure here, just like this. Okay, so hopefully you can see that clearly. Um, the green things are representing the fluorines. The chlorine is represented by the uh, purple in the middle. And then that red lone pair is represented by the tan structure. It's a uh, seesaw. There's the seesaw. It's diphenoidal. And you should see here, um, as I show this structure, that this side is most certainly different than this side. This right-hand side is different than this left-hand side. That would have a molecular dipole going in this direction here like this. So that would be like a molecular dipole. So this is most certainly polar. It's a polar structure. All right. Um, hopefully that is looking peachy fine for you. I like that one a lot. That one is a really good one here too. All right. Okay. So um, we're going to do, oh yeah, we have another one to do. Holy moly. All right. So we're going to peel this away and uh, we're going to continue on with our next Lewis dot structure. So here we go. Another page. And this is what we're at right here. Okay, and so this one is SO3 2 minus. Uh, so one of the challenges here is that you need to know your polyatomic ion names. The name of this is sulfite. So hopefully you uh, know that. Um, sulfur, there are six valence electrons. There's one of those. Oxygen, um, there are six valence electrons. There's three of those. And then I'm going to just highlight this right over here, and that is a 2 minus. So what do I do to that? I'm going to add two more electrons because of that right there. All right. So um, the total number of electrons is 26. I always divide by 2. I'm going to get 13 pairs. The least electronegative, that is most certainly going to go in the middle. 
And that is right there like that. That's that sulfur. And that is the one that's furthest away from the fluorine in comparison to the oxygen. So just to make sure here, um, what I what I recommend for my students is place a piece of string on the fluorine and then place a string on the oxygen and measure this distance. Then place a string at that central fluorine and place a string at that central sulfur and measure this distance. You should see that the one that's in farther distance away from the fluorine is the one that's going in the middle. And if I just zoom in on this here, maybe zoom in one more time, you should see that this distance between the fluorine and the sulfur is greater than the distance between the fluorine and the oxygen. That lets you know that the sulfur is going to go in the middle because it's least electronegative. The least electronegative goes in the middle, but never hydrogen. Okay, hopefully that makes sense. Um, many people are confused about the sulfur and the oxygen. All right, so we're going to place the um, oxygens here around this like such, one, two, and three in the three o'clock, six o'clock, nine o'clock position. We're going to place bonding pairs of electrons. That's a one, two, three, and then lone pairs. So that's three, uh, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, and then... 13 is on the central atom like that. There are brackets around that. That is most certainly important. And the two minus charge right there like that. All right. So uh, validating the octet rule. Octet rule. Yes, satisfied. Octet rule. Yes, satisfied. Octet rule. Yes, satisfied. Octet rule. Yes, satisfied. So again, I do that in my head and um, I don't actually physically write that down. Okay. So um, this corresponds to A for that central sulfur, X for an oxygen, 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 that's three, and then an E here for that lone pair on the central sulfur, okay? That is trigonal pyramidal, okay? And trigonal pyramidal has bond angles that are less than 109.5 five degrees. Um, alternatively, we can call this 107 degrees. Either one of those would be perfectly fine. Um, hybridization, SP1, P2, P3. So this is SP3 hybridized. If it's trigonal pyramidal, it is most certainly always polar. And there are no isomers, no resonance structures, nothing like that. So you don't have to worry about those things. That is craziness on that one. All right, let me show you um, this structure here as far as the model. So the sulfur is represented by the blue right there in the middle, and the oxygens are represented by the white ones, which would typically be hydrogens, but it is a trigonal pyramidal structure. The tan thing is the lone pair on the central atom here, and this has a, uh, a molecular dipole like this, it's like shooting right through here like that, molecular dipole, molecular dipole, and that's why it's polar. You should see that the the blue um, and the whites are not within the same plane. And since they are not within the same plane, that means it's a uh, asymmetric structure. All right, let's move on to the next one. We have um, just a few more structures to hammer out here. Let's see if we can get through these. All right. So our next one is XeO3. And so those eight valence electrons, there's one of those. And six valence electrons, there's three of those. I'm going to add those all up. And I get 26. I'm going to divide by two. And I'm going to get 13 pairs. The least electronegative, that goes in the middle. And of course, that would be the xenon. And then the oxygens are going to surround that. That's a one, two, and three. And uh, bonding pairs first, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. 10, 11, 12. I got one more to do. That would be 13 on the central element. I don't have brackets on this because this doesn't have a charge. Okay, and that lone pair on that central element there. This is A for the xenon, X1, X2, X3, X3, and then E for that lone pair on the central element there. 
Okay, the hybridization of this is sp1, p2, p3, sp3. This has bond angles that are less than 109.5 um, or 107. And anything, oh, this ax3e is trigonal or trigonal pyramidal. And we just did one of these, and that is most certainly polar. And there are no resonance or isomeric structures of this, and it looks like this one, just like what we did on the last one there. So you got that one perfectly beautiful. Okay. All right. Next one is a sulfur, and that has um, six valence electrons. There's one of those, chlorine, seven, and that's two. I'm going to add all that up. That gives me 20. And I'm going to, of course, divide this by two. And I get 10 pairs. And the least electronegative goes in the middle. That's sulfur. The chlorine and chlorine, those go just like the face of a clock, three o'clock and nine, uh, six o'clock. Bonding pairs at first. So that's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and nine and 10. Perfect, that one's done also. Notice that um, the chlorines are halogens and they always look the same thing when they are not the central element. And that is single bond, three sets of lone pairs. Single bond, three sets of lone pairs. You will never find chlorines, uh, fluorines, iodines, or bromines doubly bonded. Never, ever, ever. A, X, one, two, and then E1, E2, E2. This corresponds to angular or bent. Um, either one of those. It's S, P1, P2, P3. S, P1, P2, P3. S, P3. Okay, and this has bond angles that are less, less than 109.5 degrees or 100 and for if it's angular or bent. Anything that's angular or bent is most certainly polar because the shape itself is polar. And there, this is my angular bent structure. And hopefully you remember this one from before. We just did this one on here before earlier. All right, that's angular or bent. That is most certainly polar. And the molecular dipole is shooting through it like that. Yeah, cool. Let's go for the next one since we are just flying through these babies here. And let's move this on up just a little bit so we can see all this. Uh, yes, sponsored by the Crazy Hat Chemist. That's me. I'm donating all the money to this video here. Yeah, right. Okay, here we go. Um, five, and there's one of those, and seven, and there's five of those. I'm going to add all those up. That's a total of 40. I'm going to divide that by two. That gets me 20 pairs just like that. The phosphorus goes in the middle. The iodines surround this here. And so there are five iodines. So what I'm going to do is equally space these iodines around this phosphorus. Phosphorus is period three or greater. It happens to be in period three. But if it's in period three or greater, it can exceed the octet rule. And this is what's going to happen if I have more than four structures, four elements around the central element, of which I do in this case. So one, two, three, four, and five. That's what this is going to look like. So 20 pairs. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, almost there, 19, 20. All right, that's A, X, 5. This is going to be trigonal, bipyramidal. Okay, trigonal, bipyramidal. What does that look like? Okay. That looks like the following, and it's one of the more complicated structures. It is sp1, p2, p3d, so that's sp3d hybridized, and this has two bond angles of 120 degrees and 90 degrees, and since all the iodines are the same, this is non-polar. And let me show you what this one looks like. This is the trigonal bipyramidal structure. 
And you can hopefully see rotating in the center, there's that trigonal planar structure and then bipyramidal in that there's a, a pyramid on the top and a pyramid on the bottom. And hopefully that makes sense here for you. Trigonal bipyramidal. This is going to be symmetrical and that's why this one is nonpolar, just like such. Yeah, beautiful. All right, let's move on to this next one here. We have S that has six, there's one of those, and iodine that's seven, and there are four of those. So that's a total of 34. I'm going to divide that by two, as always, and that's 17 pairs. And the least electronegative, that's going to go in the middle, and that is the sulfur. And then there are four iodines surrounding that. So one, two, three, and four. And we're bonding one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, and finally in the middle, seventeen. That leads to um, A, X, four, E. And what is that? That is T-shaped. That is S, P1, P2, P3, D, S, P, 3, D. And um, so S, P, 3, D, this has bond angles that are 180 and 90. And this is most certainly polar. Anything that is T-shaped is polar. Let me show you that right now, okay? And so um, Mr. T, this is a pity the fool, Mr. T, if that makes sense for you, right? Um, so there's the T-shaped structure. Hopefully you can see the T-shape right there. That's T-shaped. There's these two lone pairs. This makes this most certainly asymmetric. This side is different than this side. There's a molecular dipole shooting out there like that, kind of, okay? And so this is T-shaped, T-shaped. Oh yeah, that's a beautiful thing, all right? All right, we're going to need another sheet of paper to carry on with this um, happiness here. So let's, uh, yeah, let's let's move on. Okay, so here we go. Move it on to um, another sheet of paper here, and here we go. Oh, by the way, we are almost done. So don't go away. Keep on hanging on. We are almost done, folks. Here we go. All right, so this one here is iodine and chlorine. It is not an iodine um, and a carbon and then three additional iodines. So it's not four iodines in other words, okay? Um, so iodine is uh, seven and there's one of those and then chlorine that's seven and there's three of those. So this is hopefully relatively easy. That's seven times four, that's 28. Of course, as always, we divide by two, we get 14 pairs. The least electronegative goes in the middle, but never hydrogen. And so the one that's furthest away from the fluorine is most certainly the iodine, um, right there like that. And then the chlorines are going to surround it here. Okay, and that would be chlorine, chlorine, chlorine. And now what we're gonna do is place our bonding pairs of electrons between the central and outside, central and outside, central and outside, and then our lone pairs on their outside elements. So that's one, two, three four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, 10, 11, 12, and then it's 13 and 14, okay? So um, that would be 13 and 14, just like that. Uh, okay. And 13 and 14. Oh my gosh, I made a mistake. So we are going to um, go back to that in just a second. I made a mistake on the uh, last problem here. So I'm gonna come back to that. So hold on just a moment here, made a mistake. So this one right here um, is A, X, one, two, three, and an E, one, two. And that one, this one is T-shaped. Yes, 
I did the previous one is T-shaped and that is a mistake. So we're gonna come back to that one and we're gonna make a correction here. I knew there was something that was not working here for me for that one for some reason. So this is S, P1, P2, P3, D. So this is S, P, 3, D. And that of, of course, uh, S, P, 3, D has bond angles that are 180 and 90. And this is the one that is T-shaped. And I'm gonna draw that, I'm gonna show you this one. I pity the fool, Mr. T again. Um, we did that one. And this is most certainly polar. Um, there are no geometric or um, isomers for that one. I'm going to go backwards one, and I do greatly apologize. So this one right here is um, AX4E, which is not T-shaped, folks. Holy moly. I'm glad you caught me on this. I'm glad someone is going to make a comment in there and then recorrect their comment. But this is disphenoidal. Um, disphenoidal or seesaw. And disphenoidal seesaw is certainly not 180 and 90. It is polar. It is sp 3 d hybridized. So at least I got that part right. But the bond angles are 120 and 90 and less than um, those. Okay, so correction, correction, correction. Make sure you get this correction right there. Go back to that one, por favor. I am so sorry that I messed that up. Okay, and what does disphenoidal look like? This is the disphenoidal seesaw one. We've done this one before, disphenoidal seesaw. Oh my gosh. All right, made a mistake. Uh, I guess I'm not perfect. I don't expect myself to be perfect. So here we go. But I did correct it. I did see it as I did the last one there. So I do apologize for that. This one is the T-shaped one. Um, okay, we have one more to do in just the few minutes that remain here. Hold on. And uh, here we go. Krypton, that's eight valence electrons. Hopefully I don't mess this one up here. Iodine, that's seven and two. Maybe it's just trying to do too many and a short period of time. I'm gonna add these up, that's 22. And um, I'm gonna divide by two, that's 11 pairs. Okay, fantastic, 11 pairs. Krypton goes in the middle. Then the iodines are going to surround it like thus 11 pairs. And I'm gonna have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11 pairs. Okay, this is A, X2, E3. And so that has a molecular shape of linear. That is S, P, S, P1, P2, P3, D, S, P3, D. And that is bond angles of 180. And this is non-polar. And let me show you what this one looks like. I've shown you this one before, actually. This is the linear structure with the three sets of lone pairs on the central region there. And that is most certainly just like that. All right, um, let's see here. Just to make certain that everybody is on the same page here with me, and um, let me make sure that you understand my um, mess up. So this is correct. 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 So. Um, this is correct. I made a mistake on that one. I do greatly apologize, but uh, hopefully you'll forgive me. Um, let's see here. Hopefully you got everything on this worksheet here. Hopefully you nailed everything down and boom, make sure you got that correction right there. Oh yeah, folks. Got it, got it, got it. I am the crazy hat chemist and um, I hope you have a fantastic day and every now and then I make a mistake, but not too frequently here, hopefully. All right, you have a delightful day and I will see you next time. Bye for now.